Okay, so it's not slider. তফিক স্যার শুনতে পাচ্ছেন না হ্যালো স্যার শোনা যায় না হ্যালো একটা টেস্ট করো শুনতে পাচ্ছি না হ্যালো
Yani şunu da açın tabii ki onu sağ olun. Amar unmut kora atse, ebun video on kora atse. Desktop sound type tamiyi on use kocu, onu bunu sound use kocu. Desktop tiki şunçu. Hello sir, can you hear us? Hello? It's clear. Şunda batsen. Mobile de katı mıdır konuşuyor. Mobile için kurbağa. Tıkat. Okay.
can we can start the recording Assalamualaikum. <coughs> Very good morning. Shubho Shakal Shabai ke. Um, so welcome you all to this uh, SIPG talk on the title of From City Corporations to Union Positions, Bringing the State Closer to People, What are the Global Lessons? So we have a speaker. This is a kind of a public lecture series kind of a thing that we regularly are organizing. So our today's speaker is Dr. Junaid Kamal Ahmed, Vice President Operations, MIGA, World Bank Group, and Member Board of Trust in North South University. I will give a brief introduction of uh, of his uh, uh, background a little bit later on. Uh, just to let you know that uh, South Asian Institute of Policy and Governance uh, as a policy and governance academic program and also research organization, we are uh, regularly uh, having this kind of the dialogue and especially we have a track record of working on the local government issues, both from the teaching, training and research point of view. So I just give a very brief uh, overview that what we have done till now on the issues of local government in South Asia, not only on Bangladesh. So we did a survey on citizens charter in Bangladesh, Nepal, and Sri Lanka, and it was a kind of a um, kind of a comparative study that we did, and we published this data book on the basis of this survey. And um, also recently we conducted a study on electoral violence in last union political election in Bangladesh. Uh, the study is almost finished. We are going to publish it very soon. Um, a number of graduate theses of MPPG has been, uh, have been published on service delivery of local government institutes of Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and also Bhutan. We did also a comparative study on Right to Information Act and its implication on local government institutions of regional countries. Uh, we also recently published a working paper on policy and governance challenges, a case study of mega city Dhaka. And also one book was published on policies, budget and PRSP at the promoting women rights in Bangladesh. Uh, apart from this uh, study and research and graduate thesis, we are also engaged in uh, with different government ministries, especially in Bangladesh for developing training module. One training module we developed uh, jointly with LGED ministry. The, the module was on feasibility study for establishment of central training center and divisional training center in local government engineering department of local government ministry of Bangladesh. And uh, finally, we, as our students, you all probably are aware that our students are coming from the civil service of Bangladesh, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, and so sometimes Malaysia. Uh, many of them are working in the local governments in the region. Uh, yesterday, there was a disease conference with the Prime Minister, three of our uh, alumni, MPBG alumni are already, they are DC in different districts in Bangladesh, they participated. We have probably around 15 uh, UNOs who are working in different upojelas in Bangladesh, and also in other different capacities in Nepal, Sri Lanka, also our alumni are working. So most of them, they could not join in this meeting because of it's a working day, and that's why we are recording it, and. Uh, probably it will be helpful for them uh, to get to some uh, insight from the discussion here. So with that uh, small background, I would now uh, just give a <coughs> brief introduction of Dr. Zonayat Kamal. Uh, Dr. Zonayat Kamal is a founder life member of NSU Board of Trustee and currently Vice President for the operations of the Multilateral Investment Guarantee Agency, one of the five organizations under the World Bank Group. Dr. Zunayat Kamal earned his bachelor's in economics from Brown University and master's from Harvard. He obtained his PhD in applied economics from Stanford University. He authored, authored the first article arguing for a private university in Bangladesh, and it was his father, Mr. Musluddin Ahmed, who established the country's first private university, North South University, in 1992. Mr. Musluddin Ahmed was the first president and vice chancellor of North South University, and it was Mr. Ahmed who nursed this university in his formative years. Dr. Junaid Kam uh, Kamal Ahmed was previously country director for the World Bank in India from September 2016 
to April 2022. So it's an immense pleasure to have him with us today, especially with our uh, very uh, encouraging number of participation from students and also our faculty members. Uh, I, uh, <coughs> at the beginning, I thank him for giving his time and also our vice chancellor <coughs> is chairing this session. So the modality is that we will listen from uh, Dr. Kamal, uh, uh, probably 25, 30 minutes, 30 minutes, 30, 35 minutes, and then we'll uh, open the floor and it will be a kind of a uh, question answer session. So please feel free to ask questions, give your comments and, uh, and uh, give your observations. So without any further delay, so I now would like to request Dr. Kamal to uh, give his presentation, sir. This way, this way. শুরু করেন তখন একটা ক্লাসে আমি লেকচার দিয়েছিলাম কিন্তু এইভাবে আপনাদের সামনে একটা প্রেজেন্টেশন দেওয়া गवर्नमेंट थे बेर हार पर उन्नी बोलें तेत्रिस बच्चों सरकार क्या कर তেত্রিশ বছর পরে কনসালটেন্সি তো আর করা যায় না এটা তো যেটা শিখেছি সেটা জনগণের কাছ থেকে শিখেছি জনগণের কাছে কিছু দিতে হবে তখন আব্বাকে বললাম আপনি কি করতে চান বলে দেখো গ্রাম থেকে এসেছি চোদ্দ পনেরো বছর গ্রামে ছিলাম তারপরে ঢাকা শহরে আসলাম গ্রামে একটা ছোট স্কুলে পড়তাম সব সময় একটা বিশ্বাস ছিল আচ্ছা Uh, you know, I'm talking about uh, the history of this university and my relation, my father, who brought this university up. So he, uh, he told me at retirement that he wanted to do something for the country. And for him, education is what brought him to where he was as ambassador and secretary. And it was to education that he wanted to give. So he thought of uh, the idea of a private university, but a non-profit university. private university, a private university that belonged uh, to the nation. And so was born the idea of uh, North-South University. Uh, so it's a great pleasure for me to come here and learn about uh, SIPG, uh, to recognize that this university is ranked number one uh, in an external uh, rating uh, and the vice chancellor's efforts to make that happen. It is very much a big honor to be here. So with your permission, Mr. Director, Vice Chancellor, Pro Vice Chancellor and, and colleagues, what I want to talk to you about is state structure. This is something that I've been working on across the world uh, and I've written quite a lot about it. And I want to position the state structure and ask the question, where will Bangladesh be 10 years, 15 years in terms of state structure? But in my presentation, I will not refer to Bangladesh. I'll refer to the rest of the world. And I would like you in the conversations and the Q&A to, to have a conversation of what you think the state structure of Bangladesh will look like 10 years from now. We all talk about the growth of Bangladesh from low income to now emerging as low middle income. Uh, for it to go from low middle income to high middle income is the current state structure of Bangladesh 
capable of taking us to that level? Or is there a need for us to rethink the state structure of Bangladesh? That's really the question that I'd like you to discuss. And what I'd like to offer is a little bit of the international experience to reflect on our, ex on our question about, about the future. So, uh, oh, is that moving? Okay, it's working now. But let me be very clear what I mean by state structure. This is the description of South Africa's No, it's stuck again. No, it's working now. This is the this is the structure of South Africa's uh uh state structure after President Mandela takes over. I just want to describe it so you understand what I mean by state structure. South Africa as a government, state government, is divided into a central government, provinces, and under the provinces are local government. And each of these tiers of government has a tax and it has expenditures. So for example, the province has to deal with health and education, the local governments have to deal with municipal services, water, sanitation, uh, local roads, right? So each tier of government is clear. Each tier of government has a source of income. Center has, for example, VAT. Uh, local governments have property taxes. And then there are flows of intergovernmental grants between the center provinces and local governments. That's the structure of the government uh, of South Africa. So when I talk about the state structure, the question I'm asking is, is, this a, is, is the state I'm talking about a very centralized state with all powers and responsibilities and revenues at the center? Or is it a decentralized state where expenditure, revenue, and power is, is uh, allocated across different tiers of government, right? That's how we are, I'm gonna talk about the state structure. Uh, and then there will be flows of, uh, of intergovernmental grants between the different tiers of government. That's, these, that's the framework that I will, uh, if you will, use to discuss the global experience. But before that, I, I want to just reflect on three things about uh, state formation in Bangladesh. Uh, uh, in, uh, and and it will give you a sense of, of why this question of state structure is important. Um, in 2004, I was working in Bangladesh and suggested to government of Bangladesh that the oldest tier of government in Bangladesh is the Union Parishad. It got created before national government, right? It's the oldest tier in our history. So it's the tier that's closest to the citizens. So the question I asked is, how do you strengthen the tier of government closest to the citizens? And the argument I put forward is unless you give them money directly that they have in their hands, they cannot engage with their citizens. If everything is delivered from the top, then Union Porishad is a paper tiger. But if you can give them money directly, then that will be very important. At that time, the local government minister was Mannan Bhuya, and I proposed this to him. And you know, he came from the labor unions. And his reaction was, this is exactly what we need, is to strengthen the local government from below. So we put together in the World Bank a program, local government support program for, uh, for Bangladesh. And this was, this was approved at the board just before elections. So I came to the minister. He was then the minister of local government. I said, Manan Bhai, we are ready with the program, ready to put it uh, in action. He said something very extraordinary. He said, can you hold on until the elections are over? And I asked him, you want me to hold on to the flow of money to local government before the elections? I joked with him and I said, I thought you would want the money to flow to local governments. He said, no. He said, it's too important because if 
in the elections, we win, no problem. But if we lose, I don't want the other party, the army league to say, this is a BNP project. Local government is too important for it to be caught in party politics. I was absolutely stunned, right? He then said the following to me. He said, can you please go and talk to uh, Muhit Bhai and tell him that we want to do a program on local governments. Make sure that he knows because we want it endorsed by him before we, we actually take it to the board of the World Bank. So I said, you want me to go and ask the opposition uh, party member about this? He says, yes, go talk to Mohit Bhai. He says, the only reason I'm doing is because you're a Bangladeshi working in the World Bank, right? No, no one else. So I then went and met with Mohit Bhai. I said, Mohit Bhai, we're doing a local government program. So I said, kotha, beautiful. You know, he had this habit of saying rubbish when he needed, right? He didn't say rubbish. He says, wonderful. But then he asked me a critical question. Is the money going to flow to Upozilla or Union Porishad? I said, Union Porishad. They said, fantastic. Do it. No money to uh, Union, uh, to Upozilla. Fascinating, right? You know why he said that, right? Upozilla was created by the army, was his, uh, was his statement. The reason I give you this story is you have two important personalities of two parties that said that Union Porishod is a fundamental part of the state of government, state of Bangladesh, strengthening it is very important. That's how important the story of state structure is. So that's the first story. The second story comes from, uh, from a paper written by Rahman Soban, From Two Economies to Two Nations. And he, he says something very interesting. He says, the whole partition of India into Pakistan and, and uh, uh, India was a result of the fact that you could not come up with the right allocation of powers at the regional government level. So West Bengal and on the other hand, Sindh would not get powers, right? And that was what bothered a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, uh, the leadership of Jinnah that led to the creation of Pakistan. Rahman Soban then goes on to say that what, what the leadership of the, uh, of the Awami League under Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman was basically arguing either give us federalism or give us confederation, right? But if the other side decided not to give us those two, it led to the very violent creation of Bangladesh. But Rahman Soban's hypothesis is if we had been able to establish a federation or confederation, then the arrival of Bangladesh would have been a natural, uh, natural implication of the state structure, that we would not have had to fight and lose so many of our people, so many women uh, that were destroyed, uh, so much of our infrastructure destroyed. Again, the nature of the state structure is extremely important for the stability of the nation. Third is, uh, I refer to a paper uh, uh, in, done at SIPG by uh, a senior advisor Saladin Aminu Zaman about Chittagong Hill Tracks. Now, Chittagong Hill Tracks and the protection of the people of the Chittagong Hill Tracks, do you give them a local government? Do you give them a special territory, right? Many countries around the world have those kind of territories to actually give protection to their minorities, right? And the Chittagong Hill Tracks story is literally about how do you give voice to the people of Chittagong Hill Tracks? What kind of local governments do they get in the state structure of Bangladesh? Three very different stories, but all three I share with you because it goes to the heart of the importance of what state structures mean for giving voice to people and giving the ability of the state to actually function as a state. Now, what's the snapshot of the world in this whole story of state structure? What we're seeing is today, over 80 countries are devolving powers to local governments from central government, right? This is a, a worldwide story that we're seeing. The question is, why is it that's happening? First, improving service delivery. Sitting in Dhaka, very hard 
to decide what uh, what should be uh, the nature of delivery in Borishal, right? Rather, you give power to the city of municipality of Borishal to decide what it wants. So, improving service delivery, civil society demand, right? Civil society in Teknaf is going to say that I want my elected leader next to me so that I can make my demand. I cannot just expect all leadership to be at the central level, too far from me and my needs of the day, right? Even uh, I live in Bonani and the road in front of my apartment has been a horrible mess for the last two months. It's just across from the uh, political headquarters of the mayor of, uh, uh, of uh, my part of the city, right? I have absolutely no access to that mayor to say, you know, when are you going to fix my road? Right. That's the whole nature of civil society demand. Bring government closer to me. Conflict and nation formation. Look at Afghanistan. Can Afghanistan be a stable, a stable state? A lot of people will say the only way you can keep Afghanistan stable is having a central government that's very strong. That's a security model of state uh, protection. Others would say, if you want different tribal groups of Afghanistan to belong to one nation, give them power. Each will feel they belong to the nation. So decentralize, make Afghanistan federal, very different state structure. But conflict of nation is asking for different types of states. Technology changes. At one time, you could only deliver electricity at a central level. Today, you can deliver electricity unbundled at the local level. Should it become a local government uh, expenditure, right? Uh, technology change is also changing the nature of the state. Urbanization, the arrival of cities and towns, emergence of mayors is around the world creating a demand for stronger city governments, right? This is, this is a, a major, major story. But the key lesson around the world is bringing government closer to people is a political process, not a technical process, not a fiscal process. It's a political process of creating accountability and checks and balances, right? So if I'm sitting in Borishal and I have a mayor that I can hold accountable for my goods today, right? It's a great sense of citizenship, but it's also a sense of accountability to the mayor of Borishal that they better know that the mayor and council would know what to do. Now, the, the rise of the state has historical roots, right? It's not ahistorical. It depends on the history. Take two federal nations, US and India. The US emerges bottom up, meaning the states of United States get together and they create the federal or central government. And that is why the powers of the state is very strong because they decide to give up some powers to the center. And naturally, the states will only give up some powers of the cent to the center, not everything. On the other hand, India emerges as a nation state from colonialism. So it emerges as national, uh, national conflicts lead to the creation of India. That means it comes as a strong center. It chooses to give powers to the states and local government. Local governments in India are much weaker than local governments in the United States because the historical process of the creation of the state is very different. In the US, it's bottom up. In India, it's top down because of colonialism. So history matters a lot in the way the state is formed. So we have to ask ourselves, where does Bangladesh is in its historical process in order to think about the historical process of where Bangladesh will be 10 years from now. So this is a snapshot of what I'm saying. Countries around the world are decentralizing. The forces of decentralization are big. Key to it is a political economy of bringing accountability of government in close to people. Third, please don't forget the history of the nation because that determines the nature of how decentralization happens. Um, <clears throat> there is a whole literature, academic literature, and it would be wrong of me to come to a university and not refer to it. The whole academic literature around how decentralization and state structure is analyzed. There is a public finance angle, 
There is a principal agent angle. There's a state formation angle. And these are very different, uh, if you will, academic schools of thought that lead to thinking about the state structure. So take, for example, Nepal. A pure public finance story would say Nepal is a small country, right? Not too many people relative to us. It shouldn't be decentralized. You should centralize it to get economies of scale. That's what the public finance model will tell you. But the state formation model says Nepal is made up of many different ethnic groups. If you want to keep them together, give each of them a local government that they own. Then they will feel they belong to the nation state. Right? That's a fundamentally different uh, uh, answer to state formation, depending on which type of uh, thinking you, you enter into. So very important, especially for uh, uh, SIPG and its relationship to what is taught at NSU, is that these are very fundamental literatures is looked at very differently. So what's the international experience of the decentralization? So the way I want to look at it is to say what to avoid. So if you're a centralized state and you want to decentralize, what should you avoid in that process, right? If you're a decentralized state, it's very hard to see someone giving up powers to the center, but the other way around is where the political game is. The first is expenditure clarity. Each level of government should have clear, a, a clear story of what it must do. South Africa, for example, at the district level, which is the local level, has districts and municipalities. But the responsibility of these two, dis two tiers is not clear, so you have quite a bit of conflict. Similarly, center and province both do education, which means that there's a conflict. It's not clear who does what in education. So if you have a lack of expenditure clarity between tiers of government, it creates problems in terms of delivery. Ask yourself the question, what does a Upazila do in Bangladesh and what does a Union Porishad do in Bangladesh, right? Do they overlap or is there a real distinction? Right? That's, a, that's a, uh, an analytical question that you need to, need to ask. So first, first story, make sure each tier of government has clear, uh, uh, clear responsibility. Otherwise, accountability to citizens is very difficult because in province uh, in South Africa, can tell its citizens, I'm unable to give you education because actually it's the center that's running with it, not me, right? So each can blame, blame the other in front of the citizen. Another thing to avoid is limited own resources. So you create union polishod, but you don't, don't give them any money. If you don't give them any money, how can they relate to the citizens and the needs of the citizens? So you have to actually divide the taxation system very clearly into the different tiers of government. But here the public finance world will tell you that it is more efficient to collect taxes at the center for certain resources. That means the intergovernmental grant system then becomes very important. So if I, the center, collect everything, then how I give the money back to local government matters. I can give the money back as conditional money. You can only do the following three things with the money I give you. Or I can give you the money as unconditional grant based on number of people, uh, maybe weighted by poverty. It's your money. I just collected it for efficiency reason. How you give the money is extremely important. So not only passing taxes down, but also the nature of the intergovernmental system is extremely important. This goes back to the conversation between uh, 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 Manan Bhai and Mohit Bhai, uh, moving money to Union Porishod both agreed that you should give unconditional grants to them so that the accountability is with the union council as to what they will do with the money, right? And they wanted to give it as block grants, formula driven. So it's not the discretion of the center what they will give each year. Both leaders agreed on that. That's fundamental in terms of shifting, shifting the, the tiers. The other is avoid too many tiers. So India is, a, is an excellent example. At the local level, you have district, you have block uh, panchayat, you have gram panchayat, zilla panchayat, gram shabha, many tiers at the local level. And so you have a lot of tension as to who does what and who does the citizen hold accountable for services. But we have to ask ourselves, you have union porishod, you have upazila, you have districts. 
right? Are these clearly aligned? And if we're going to strengthen Union Porishod, what should be underneath Union Porishod? Now, India has Gram Shobha, right? Panchayats, right? Do we have village councils where the citizens and the elected leaders can meet and decide what they want to do? So how many tiers and its relationship to citizenry becomes very important too. And, and hence this story, limited city, city involvement. Pakistan's uh, uh, local governments uh, actually don't have institutions of voice, right? And what you will find that in those countries where local governments don't have institutions of voice, very powerful NGO delivery systems emerge because the citizens feel the voice in them. So here's my question to you. Is Bangladesh's NGO system a sign of a failed state? Or is Bangladesh's NGO system a sign of voice that allows citizens to actually engage with the state? Right. This is a very, very important point. And I, I have to say, for those of you who have not read uh, Abed Bhai's uh, writings, please read them. Because Abed Bhai in BRAC is constantly asking the question, I can mobilize citizens, I can mobilize the poor, but how do I get the poor to influence the state, right? That relationship, I think, is fundamental to the functioning of the local level. And Bangladesh is at the, I would say, the cutting edge of this relationship between NGO and the local state, right? This was Abid Bhai's vision in terms of what he wanted to do. Uh, and, and, and I think that today's BRAC has to ask the question, are they a corporate delivery of local services or are they a vehicle to actually influence the state in terms of service delivery? A very, very important question. I don't know the answer to that. I'm, I'm, I'm raising it to you as, as an issue. The other is upper tier in, in, interference. I remember once uh, listening to Trityo Matra and there was a parliamentarian, a young parliamentarian who was explaining the many roles that he has. And he talks about how when he goes to the, uh, to the village, he has to even solve marriage problems, right? That's how important he is as a parliamentarian. He has to solve the land problems. And so there were telephone calls asking him questions. So I said that if you're so interested in local issues, why don't you run for union Porishwad rather than running for parliament? Because my, your job as a parliamentarian is to do legislation, not solve the marriage problems at the village level, right? I, he didn't quite uh, enjoy my, uh, my comment because I then followed it up to say that this MP fund that is so prevalent in Africa and South Asia is an interference with the functioning of local government, right? So should you have MP now? On the other hand, our members of parliament are right. I go to my constituency for votes. I need to be able to deliver things to them, right? But this is the tension of a state structure. If you really want to deliver to your constituency, think about running for a mayor. Think about running for a uh, uh, for union position. But if you want to support the nation, right, then you have the right to think of central government. But don't confuse the two roles, right? But often the reality is is the two roles is, are confused. Then there is the bureaucracy. Right. I remember uh, when my father used to go to his village, uh, the UNO would come, the Union Polish chairman would come. He was the secretary and, and he would be, uh, you know, he, we would go to the, the, <laughs> to the UNO's office and he, he would get to sit on the chair that has the towel. Right. Here, the power is the city. I have always dreamt from when I said, I want to, when I grow up, sit in a chair with a towel. That was the power of, uh, of uh, you, go to, you go to India and you go to the local government, there's a chair with the towel, right? But that's a sign of the bureaucracy's involvement in local politics. Should bureaucracy have that kind of power? That not a lot of people will say, but local politicians have one objective, whereas the state bureaucrat has a, a neutral objective. Right? But then if you read uh, uh, the, uh, the public finance world, uh, uh, public finance, it says the state is not benign. Bureaucrats are not benign. So how do you create checks and balance? That's also part of uh, state structure and the accountability. These are questions we have to ask as Bangladesh thinking 10 years forward. Civil service reform cannot be seen independent of state structure. 
So upper tier interference is determined by the nature of the bureaucracy also. So let me show you the tension here. So you have central government, local government, and communities in service delivery. Well, sometimes central governments will bypass local governments to deliver to communities uh, through line agencies and PMUs. You know the famous DPHE or in India, PHEDs? Do they care about local governments? No. They're a line agency. They deliver LGRD. Uh, and, uh, 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 you know, LGRD has been a big deliverer of services. Now, you can say, but look, a nation needs this kind of line agencies to deliver, right? That's the efficiency model of delivery. But does that create local governments that are accountable to citizens? Maybe not. The other is uh, uh, the other is central government delivering to communities through NGOs or NGOs delivering through com to communities directly, right? So a lot of donors. Uh, have come to Bangladesh and they fund NGOs to deliver services direct directly. Does that strengthen our state or does it weaken our state? Right? What's the relationship? Right? What we do know that if you want to scale up services to communities and you want to hold that delivery system accountable, then you have to bring the NGOs and line agencies into interface with local governments. Right? So everything that I've said, what to avoid is to actually try and create this kind of relationship. If you believe that the state at the local level is an important part of accountability, democracy, voice, and service delivery efficiency. That's the fundamental uh, assumption in everything that I'm saying. Uh, one very specific issue, city government, right? So let me begin with uh, what a great uh, Greek mathematician said in Alexandria in 220 BC. He said, the world is not flat. Now, what did he mean? And what would, do we mean? I take this as saying that economic concentration happens in density, not in dispersed cities. E productivity is driven by density. When consumers and uh, producers are close to each other, when producers are close to each other, that economies of scale and, 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 and if you will, reduction in the cost of delivery gives you your economic productivity. Take a look at this. You see these mountains uh, uh, here? These mountains of Japan is a measure of where the economic GDP lies. Look, it lies in Osaka, it lies in Nagoya, it lies in Tokyo, it lies in Sapporo. It lies in the urban centers of Japan. If you look at the United States, look at where the ec economic GDP is, uh, is concentrated. They're all concentrated in the urban centers on the West Coast and the East Coast of the United States. Similarly, when you go to South uh, Korea, see where its economic production is concentrated again, around urban systems. This is the power of urban, right? People say, you know, the green Bangladesh, the ri rivers of Bangladesh, the rural. Why do, why, do all the, why do all the people of the rural areas migrate to the cities? Because they know better that where is economic density, where is economic productivity? But it means that the cities are, are uh, uh, and urban areas is where the economic growth is. No country has grown to high income without urbanizing. No country has grown to high income without urbanizing. We're not going to de-urbanize Bangladesh. We're going to urbanize Bangladesh even more, which means we better figure out how we will manage our cities, how we will manage our towns. Today, you are, uh, you are sitting in uh, traffic jams. That's just one example of a dysfunctional management of a city. Right. This is uh, in East Asia. This is in India. If you notice, the India's concentration is Delhi, Mumbai, Kolkata, Chennai, the four big metropolitan areas. That's where the concentration of its GDP. This is your country. And that, 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 that mountain there is not Tekna for sure. Right. So the question is, 
how do you manage density? So I'm going to give you the tale of two cities. Now, having gone from explaining the state structure, I'm talking about now going to talk about city structure. So just giving powers to local government is not enough. You have to start thinking about how local government itself needs to be structured. And I'm going to give you the example of a big city to tell you the, the challenge of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of managing cities. So here, Johannesburg, city of 4 million people, is a decentralized city. And I'll explain that. Dhaka, at that time when I did this slide, was 12 million. I think it's now about 18 million, right? It's a centralized city. Let's see what, what do I have. So Johannesburg starts off in the apartheid area with seven white municipalities and four black councils. After democracy comes in, they aggregate this into one metro council and four local councils underneath it. And then finally, they create one city government with one tax base, right? So it's a, it's a transition that they went through over a period of about uh, eight years. So you have one city, one mayor, and one tax base. But the city is restructured in a very different way. You have the metropolitan government, and it's responsible for water, roads, electricity, sanitation. But how does it structure itself? Not as departments of the city, it actually creates companies, public companies, water and sanitation company, waste company, electricity company. Each of these companies are run, is a public sector, it's run like a company, right? So we have WASA, okay? Right? They have a WASA, but that WASA is arm's length. For, well, that WASA, first of all, is owned by the city. The mayor owns the WASA. The mayor sets the MOU with WASA, but the WASA has a separate company's law that, uh, it, through which it is formed. It can go into the capital markets to borrow, but it must respond to the mayor's plan for the delivery of the city, right? It's as close as you get to a private company running water without being a private company, right? Meanwhile, the mayor runs the fiscal, the local budget. It sets the, the policy, but it doesn't run the services. It has de delegated the services to companies. At the same time, it's, the mayor is responsible for slum upgrading, primary health, and people center. That's where the citizens interface happens. So they divided the city into regions, and those regions is where the counselors meet with the citizens directly, where health clinics and education uh, schools are, are run. And what happens is that the companies have to deliver into each of the regions. There is an MOU, there's a contract, and any surplus is transferred to, sent to metropolitan government to actually fund the public goods uh, in terms of health and, and education. I remember asking, asking the mayor when Johannesburg actually had water department, waste department, electricity department, versus when they created the company, what was the big difference for the mayor? The mayor said the following, when everything belonged to me and I ran as a department, every day I was signing a paper, buy so many tires for the, for the uh, 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 trucks, um, uh, bring in uh, a generator for the, uh, for all were inputs, right? But when he created the company, he said, now I call the CO in and say, how come district two is not getting water, right? I now no longer worry about signing the bills of generators. I now demand, I gave you the money to give water. Why is the water not coming? It becomes outcomes focused. So the structure of the local government really matters in terms of how you deliver the services. Question is, who does WASA's director respond to? The mayor of Dhaka? I don't think so, right? Here, the water responds to the mayor of Johannesburg. Very big difference. Now, Johannesburg had a, had a, uh, ch had a chance. What they did was it, with electricity generation, they sold it. Water and, uh, and sanitation, they ran as a management contract. IT, they did a sales and lease. In other words, each of these companies you can organize 
the way you want to organize them, right? It's a fascinating, uh, fascinating story. This is Dhaka. So Dhaka is run by Rajuk. It's run by Wasa. It's run by Tita's Gas. It's run by Electricity, Desco. In other words, here's a city run by line departments and PMUs vertically, right? You try to fix the congestion of Dhaka city. Police is run by someone, traffic management, roads are done by someone, right? Uh, how are you gonna bring them together? Well, the bureaucratic answer is, oh, we form a coordinating committee on Dhaka. Well, you see the coordinating committee on Dhaka working, right? It requires our prime ministers to say, I'm gonna put flyovers here, I'm gonna put a metro here. So I'm proud to tell the world that my mayor of Dhaka city is my prime minister. Johannesburg would never dare say that the mayor of Johannesburg is the president of South Africa. Right? Now, which structure is right for us? That the mayor of Dhaka is the prime minister or the mayor of Dhaka is actually the mayor of Dhaka? This is where I go back to my story. You have to talk, look into the history and the politics of a nation to decide which structure is right. There is no blueprint here, right? It becomes a, becomes a, a search. Now, when you go from center to decentralizing, it's a process. So when I went to Kenya and Kenya decided to decentralize, they had a shift of political, uh, political parties and they decided to decentralize. And my first message to them was, this is going to take you at least 15 years. And they looked at me and said, no, 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 no. We made a commitment. We shall decentralize by, by the end of our, our political term. And I said, I bet $100 that when I come back 10 years from now, you're still debating all of these issues. Decentralization is a process. It's a political process. It will never be a linear process. It will always be in disequilibrium. The challenge is to manage the disequilibrium, right? Sometimes expenditures will be decentralized, but revenues won't. Sometimes revenues will be decentralized, but expenditures won't, right? Sometimes political decentralization happens. You're electing union Purishad leaders every X number of years, but they have no money. You have politically decentralized, but you haven't fiscally decentralized. These disequilibriums, is what delivers accountability and service delivery. So managing the disequilibrium itself is very much part of this storyline, right? How do you do it? How do you actually, as a, as a government, manage a decentralization process, right? And this is where having a constitution that gives you the direction, legislation that locks in the process, and then governments can, over time, deal with it, but constitutional legislation keep you well, well embedded in the direction that you have to go. So let me go to the key lessons. So if my story to you is the state structure determines accountability, it determines the delivery of services, it determines economic growth, for example, how you manage cities where, where the economic growth is, is coming together, then designing the structure of the state is fundamental to your economic path. As you go from low income to low middle income to high middle income. So then the question always is, is one state structure fit for all times? Clearly the answer is no. But then how do you engage in state changes? You engage in state changes by changing the nature of tiers of government, by changing the nature of where power lies, and you change the nature of how money flows between the different tiers of government. So a lot of people will say, you know, most of our capacities at the center, devolving powers to local government will be disaster for us, right? So capacity is always used as an as excuse for not giving, uh, giving powers to local government. 
And the lesson we have learned is that functions, finance, and functionaries, if you don't devolve, you don't create capacity, right? Second, capacity grows with responsibility. So if you don't give responsibility, you won't get capacity to grow. But responsibility needs own resources. If you don't give own resources, you won't have responsibility, nor will you trigger capacity. And if you have own resources, then you can have accountability because you now have money, I can hold you accountable, right? You can hold the board of trustees accountable for what they do with the money of North-South University. But if this board of trustees has no money, what are you going to hold us accountable for? That same principle here. And accountability is ensured through two very important mechanisms, citizens' involvement in local government and central government auditing, auditing writ large, not the narrow auditing of local government. And when you talk about citizens' involvement, the question we have to ask in Bangladesh is, is our NGO movement bypassing governments or is it contributing to the accountability of government? Is it giving voice to citizens or is it taking voice away from citizens? That is fundamental to the story of the state, uh, uh, state's uh, function. So for me, as I look at the international examples, I ask myself, what will be the future of the structure of Dhaka city? What will be the future of Upozilla and Union Porishod? What will be the future of Poroshova? Right? And will these tiers of government be strengthened to bring the state closer to the people of Bangladesh? We are 165 million people, right? That's a lot of people to manage from one place. Right. The state must respond to this, this amazing you know, pool of people. And today, if you go to uh, Teknaf or you go to uh, Kumilla or you go to Cox's Bazaar, people have very different aspirations. People have very different needs. So they're saying one stop government won't solve. I need a government close to me that knows my needs and can respond to my needs, right? Today, Cox's Bazaar is dealing with the Rohingya crisis. That Rohingya crisis will require central government, but also local government to both work together to deal with that crisis, right? Is our state structure ready for that kind of storyline? So I don't know the answer to that question. And what I wanted to do today was summarize for you probably 15 years of work that I've been doing in this whole story of local government. These are the lessons I have brought forward for myself and I present them to you. And I think your response of whether any of this is relevant for us in Bangladesh and if relevant, where is it relevant? And then ask the fundamental question, if it's relevant, What's the political process that will give us the relevance of these lessons applied to this country? Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Zunayat Kamal. Uh, fascinating presentation, uh, kind of a mesmerizing the whole audience. I can see that uh, and uh, in my view also, this is probably one of the best uh, lectures that I have heard on this local government uh, and decentralization in recent time. Uh, I will not uh, uh, take much time before going to the audience just to let uh, the, the, a little bit of the uh, <clears throat> recapitulating that because some of you probably joined later on. So he started his lecture with the state structure and that's a very important thing. And and they talked about uh, the difference, their different experience globally. So it was a kind of a, a, a comprehensive picture of the decentralization in this world in the current time that we have listened from him, uh, from different countries and from international experience to national and also the local. And uh, the lecture was very much 
uh, relevant for Bangladesh because these international lessons, now we can have debate and discussion that how much we can uh, relate it with the Bangladesh situation. And one point that he specially emphasized on the historical process is important that uh, we need to understand that how local government system uh, has been developed in different countries in different ways. And uh, we have this colonial kind of a uh, tradition and other countries also, they have uh, different kind of the experiences. Um, one important aspect probably that he raised that um, the role of the uh, <clears throat> legislature in the development wars that we are seeing in many parts of the South Asia and also in Africa. Uh, I just want to mention here one study that uh, I conducted uh, a few years back to understand uh, why this is happening. Also in Thailand and many of the South Asian countries, these block grants have been allocated to the MPs and then they have been engaged with the, directly the works which are supposed to be done by the uh, Union Parishad Zubchalas. And this was a perception a study to understand what do people want from the legislatures. And surprisingly, the, the issue came that the general people also want to see that the legislatures are engaged in developmental works. Uh, they, are, they are not bothered much about the lawmakers are making laws or not, but they think that, okay, if I have a problem with my marriage of my daughter or a land problem with my brother or anything related with my personal life, my MP, I can, or my Upojala chairman, I can directly get access and I try to get uh, uh, resources or support from him. So this is probably a contextualization problem. And then we also need to, academicians and practitioners, uh, they can, they need to think about uh, that, uh, how to address this issue that uh, if the people also have the expectation in one side, but theoretically the, lawmakers shouldn't be engaged in the development work. As he rightly said, that if you want to really uh, give support to your local community, then you, why not you run for the Upojala election, Union position or City Corporation election rather than an MP election. So these are the very interesting uh, debates and discussions. And also in his uh, last part of the discussion, he very interestingly mentioned about things to avoid. And uh, this is a fascinating kind I have not uh, uh, listen anything like this before and also the question of political administrative and fiscal uh, decentralization and if these three decentralizations are not happen simultaneously what can be the result in many countries and also lastly the uh, key issues so now i will open the floor and uh, just to let you know some of the modalities because we have a huge number of students and also uh, our faculty members who are participating and some of our faculty members are also uh, the practitioners like they served in the government before and now teaching in SIPG or in other departments in economics and others. And they have also experience on working uh, on doing research on accountability. <clears throat> uh, we would like to request uh, that you just specifically ask the question and probably to save the time if we assume that all protocols are maintained not not to give so many these <laughs> fundamental things and just coming to the directly question and also if you have uh, comments or uh, observations uh, so two minutes or one to two minutes time for each of the respondents so i we will take few and then we'll go back to the keynote speaker so dr rezon ulalum he raised his hand so can, can, can i just say you. can i just say one thing please uh, I want to make sure that everyone understands that I did not speak here as the vice president of the World Bank. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right? I spoke as uh, a Bangladeshi who is in international development and shared, uh, uh, shared his views uh, of uh, state formation. Uh, and also, uh, I hope you understand that I, I, I am not a, uh, how shall I put it? I do not come to speak in, in front of uh, professors. I came to speak to the students. And with the students, I want to be provocative. So if I say that the mayor of uh, Dhaka is the prime minister and tomorrow's newspaper says that, <laughs> you, you know that I was speaking to you and not to them, right? <laughs> so I just want to make those uh, caveats uh, very, uh, very clear. All right. And uh, thank you, sir. And again, uh, just to a uh, very brief, uh, otherwise yeah, I'll be a little absolutely, bit harsh. Absolutely, Sorry absolutely. for that. Yeah, thank you very much. For, uh, it was a very interesting uh, discussion, actually, probably the uh, presentation that you have made. Two points. Uh, uh, 
uh, where is, what is the examples in China because of the fact that the uh, 36,000 Politburo members actually ruling the 1.4 billion people? Uh, that's the number one question. The second is the Bangladesh experience. I would like to draw the uh, uh, point on the, the culture of impunity. And uh, as far as the behavioral science goes and the behavioral economy goes, that you cannot actually change the behavior if it is actually 21 days, actually is already passed. So now we have generations of generations of cultural impunity. How actually you actually deal with that one? Thank you. We will take some more questions and comments and then come. We have with us also Professor Saladin Aminu Zaman. Uh, he joined online. Professor Saladin, can you hear us? Yes, I do. Okay, so we uh, because he is one of our main expert on local government, he's been doing research on local government issues for, for more than 40 years. So probably a little bit more time for you. So sir, please, can you just give your comments or questions? Is it, is it for me? Yes, please. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad that I have met one of my very uh, respected colleagues, Chams uh, Janayad. I remember we had a very good memory when we designed the LGS first. And with his leadership and with a very enlightened team, we have struggled to convince the government. But I can tell you, Dr. Janadi has been following it from overseas, and I have been following here in Bangladesh. We tried our best, and it is gradually taking root. And the good thing that we mentioned at the end of your lecture is that demand side. I believe demand side has been created, not to the standard we expect, but it has been created. So I must congratulate you as the chief architect. Maybe I'm a minor architect with you, but we could have managed to done something long back. Now, <clears throat> what is really I found from this, your presentation is that you have raised the question, what is needed in Bangladesh? I think you have very correctly identified uh, three, four points. One that is local government capacity. Now, one would say, well, it is 200 years old almost, the Indian, 150 years almost. Why do you need capacity? Frankly speaking, capacity was not being seriously considered. And all the so called capacity uh, effort has been more ritualistic and not sustained, really, to be honest. That's what my recent findings feel the same. And more responsibility, you have mentioned that also. Fortunately, uh, recent uh, local government ordinances and so it have given a bunch of activities. And if you go and make a survey right now to any local government, starting from municipality down to the Indian Parishad, if you ask the question, I have I really wanted to know out of this bulk of 66, 68 functions, would they really mention something else? And then again, I would say, I would say, I would say, I would say, I would the fact is that United we have been, quote unquote, most probably failed to really reset their mindset that Rasta Ghatta is not local government. Their yes, services are concerned. They have other responsibilities to address, and they're supposed to be accountable for the actions. The rest of the two Rasta Ghatta, everything is found to be ritualistic. Even they are not fully aware of that. Or, a monetary instrument that we have involved during the last 10 years has not been really institutionalized in their mindset. At the end of the day, they will be really qualified on good ground. But fact is that I fully agree with you, and I, I can't at all drag in anymore, that in order to make a demand side of democracy, quality democracy, we have to really make the local government stronger. And it's local government in true sense, 
and keeping in view their engagement to the society, their integrity issues, and their downward accountability, which is most probably missing. And that, in fact, gets reflected at the national level eventually, because we believe as a student of political science and public administration that local government is the building ground of democracy. So an MP banks on primarily to good extent on his board banks is the UP chair. So next is between MP and UP chair is on political negotiation that if you win what 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 I get and if I get elected what you get this kind of equation is gone not a public contact with the people side or the demand side this is perhaps the challenge. Uh, okay. So yeah are you done sir? No I just one more uh, question that I think we have to raise and that he has discussed already is we haven't been able to, Dr. Jinnad was probably library, that three conventional local government deliverables or requisites is functions, finance, and functionaries. All these three things are still yet to be in place to make the local government really more functional. Thank you for the moment. So we'll, we will come back to the faculty from the student side. Is there any question? Okay, so we have uh, one uh, master's in policy and governance student here, please. Okay, okay, sir, thank you. And good afternoon. My name is Shakir Mohammed. I'm a student of policy and governance at SIPG. And you have uh, rightly pointed out about the importance of the political process. And whenever I need to feel hopeful about life, I read books. Uh, because when you read books, you see everything makes sense. But in reality, it's a different story. Uh, one problem with our current parliament and the government system is that the parliamentarians cannot vote against uh, the, their political party. So it eventually boils down to the decision of one person. So even if the demand side is there, it will eventually be decided by one person. So how you convince that person is more important than creating a, a mass movement or like convincing the mass people about the importance of decentralization and things like that. So how do you solve that? That is my question. Okay, so we'll take uh, one or two more comments and then uh, we'll come back to the speaker and then we'll again come back. Okay, Dr. Helal, our Dean of School of Business and Economics. Thank you. Most fascinating, um, should I say, one on one for me on political process and uh, uh, decentralization process. Um, for an humble economist, I was thinking, I, I was focusing on the last slide about the lessons, uh, about capacity leading to responsibility to resource, own resources, and then accountability. Um, might give a sense that it's kind of a unilateral, uh, sorry, unidirectional process, but it is not. Uh, it's non-linear, you say. So the, my one question is how to sequence the reforms, which will give us a big bang for buck and will uh, put in place reforms or changes in others so we get, uh, so that's one point. Uh, in terms of the, the capacity, resources and all that, uh, I would like to sort of uh, throw a few uh, facts and figures. Um, I, I think the emphasis is about jurisdictional clarity and, and awareness about it uh, across the board. Um, so that's a big ask, I think, given the trust deficit, serious tr trust deficit, and the um, you know, institutional malfunctioning or uh, you know, um, killing some of the functional institutions. So that's a big thing there. In terms of finances, I think at this stage, uh, only 10% of GDP is our tax take and not um, uh, for budget purposes, right? And, and most of it is coming from indirect taxes, uh, tariffs and VATs, um, and, and also you know, direct taxes doesn't have much in there with all the corporate taxes, concession, things like that. So uh, in terms of allocation from the, these tactics to this, what you call it, allocation scheme or uh, grants commission, grant scheme and things like that. That's a big issue, I guess. And especially uh, you refer to uh, uh, the big mountains. So in that context, the remote areas 
are sure to lose if you rely if you are to rely on your local resources. Uh, so the allocation from the central is paramount for them to function. Uh, in terms of um, uh, yeah. Well, um, the other things I was, I was thinking, so the second question is, um, given all those imperatives and realities, including trust deficit and institutional lackings, um, I think 15 years was your threshold for South Africa. I'm just wondering whether it would be a lot more for us. Very interesting question. Thank, Thank you, Rafael. Well, we'll take the last question of this round from a student. He raised his hand and then I'm Come back to the faculty again, so don't worry. Yeah, uh, my name is Tanver. I am a business student majoring in marketing. So I think uh, one of the points that was brought up during the speech is uh, there's a communication issue between Upozilla and Union Porishat, and also there's a lack of accountability within the levels of government. So as a business student, to me, this kind of looks like a project management issue. Um, so what forms of digital communication uh, systems are there within the government internally um, so that there is accountability and there are delegation features within the government. Because if you if a system like that can be set up, we have that technology, then we wouldn't have many of the issues. Again, I'm, I'm just suggesting I don't know. I'm asking a question. And I think another one is uh, giving money to local levels of government. Um, now, you have Bitcoin and you can kind of track the flow of money, but you can also track the flow of money through digital payment systems. So if local government in, uh, representatives could only spend government funds through digital systems, which are trackable, wouldn't that hold them further accountable? And I think another topic was uh, decentralizing people from Dhaka city and dispersing it. So the way that I see it, uh, the world is moving towards automation. And Bangladesh's economy is currently uh, very reliant on garments. But in the future, all we would have if garments get automated is we wouldn't have garments because that would go elsewhere, but we would have human capital. Um, so if we turn human, our human capital into, let's say, put them on the forefront of technology and then outsource digital works from abroad to the country, uh, that would kind of remove the necessity of people to live in Dhaka to make an income if we could digitize the country and create those systems. So maybe that would help. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Very good question. So now we would like to go back to the speaker. <clears throat> oh. Very challenging uh, questions and uh, insights. China. Interestingly, China is one of the most decentralized countries in the world. Right? This is very interesting. Theirs is, theirs is not a political decentralization, what they have recognized is that you have to decentralize economic, fiscal management powers to the local government. So some of the top leaders of China have made it to the top because they were asked to run cities and deliver on the cities. And if they delivered on the cities, they would get promoted, right? So instead of a political uh, 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 allocation, it was a Politburo allocation to decentralize the delivery. So it's a very fascinating story of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, China. Uh, and I think uh, that gives you a sense that there is no one path to uh, local, uh, local delivery systems. But in China, the accountability is top down. It is not bottom up. But the top down accountability is for bottom down delivery. So they were able to, uh, to manage that. So this is not, it, it's one of the fascinating stories of China that Chinese cities are run in a decentralized manner, despite the fact that the country is run by a Politburo. Uh, so it's a very different, uh, uh, different uh, context. Uh, Saladin Bai on, on LGSP, absolutely. You have, to, you, have, if you, you have to strengthen the demand side, even as you bring down the supply side. But the point is, by bringing down supply side, meaning putting money into hands of local government, giving them responsibility, triggers the demand side, right? If, if local governments don't have power, citizens are not going to waste their time demanding things from local government. They will go to where, uh, where the power lies, right? So it's a, it's a, dynamic, uh, a dynamic process. 
but it's a process that can be uh, can be managed. But uh, uh, Saladin Bai is absolutely right that how we trigger the demand side is essential to make decentralization work. Uh, so as you do the supply side, you need to strengthen uh, Gram Shabha and village councils, uh, ward councils and cities so that there's a mechanism of official voice uh, in the uh, allocation system of, uh, uh, of the country. I think many of you will have seen the Channel I uh, uh, agricultural program, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh, Sheikh Shiraj, where he does the agricultural budgeting, where he brings all the communities out and they talk about the agriculture budget. Think of that at a local government continuous process of budgeting and so on. This is, this is what that demand side uh, uh, one talks about. Um, it, 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 the question, uh, decentralization is a political process. Different countries are at different uh, uh, levels of political process. Uh, and uh, different political forces unleash uh, the demand for local government or, uh, or citizens' uh, participation. Uh, if you read, if you read some of the writings of Bongo Bondu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, he has faith in local governments. Uh, he, his vision is of a local government. So the founder of our nation starts off by talking about local governments. The founder of our nation draws on the movement of people for the freedom of the country. So our roots lie in, uh, in that. Remember the roots of our language movement lies in students uh, 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 coming out. So the political participation of, of people uh, is, is inherent in our, in our culture. The political process which brings them in has been evolving and will continue to evolve. What will be the path of Bangladesh? I don't know, but I think that is something that institutions like North-South ought to uh, be looking at and asking what has happened in other countries and where is our processes going and where do we, where do we go? Uh, but it, it is, the, it is the essence of the of the storyline for uh, for sure. Uh, it, it's not unidirectional. That it's it's a it's a it's a non uh, non linear. The sequencing. So, um, for me, some of the uh, prerequisites. You need a legislation that's we agree. If you have a legislation, then disequilibrium can be managed because the legislation sets the North Star, sets the direction. Then you can, you can be up in one, low in one, but you know where the country's laws <clears throat> take you. So I think we need to do an analysis of what does local government law tell us today and where are we relative to that? I think that anchors the, the sequencing very much. Um, I always have come to the belief, let money flow before expenditures. Because if you let money flow, the demand will, uh, will emerge uh, in terms of what, what, can be, what can be done. So if there's a disequilibrium, I think works, it's the money racing ahead of expenditure responsibility. And if you add digitization to the flow of money, where, uh, uh, in fact, when we designed the LGSP, the Local Government uh, Support Program, uh, the block grants were to come in two installments to the union porishads. And what we wanted to do was every time the block grant came into the local government union council bank account, we wanted every citizen of that union Porishod's mobile phone to get a simple notice that says, your union Porishod has just received so many lakh taka, right? Then people know that that money has come to the council, uh, uh, council uh, uh, bank account. So digitization correctly, uh, not only ensures greater accountability, uh, it actually ensures greater uh, uh, efficiency uh, in the uh, in the storyline. Um, I remember once going to uh, our uh, uh, our union. Uh, we are from Bancharampur Thana in Brahmanbaria, and our house, our village house, sits across two union parishads. Uh, and the two chairmen came to uh, see uh, my father in one of his visits. And my father at that time asked uh, <clears throat> that I understand there's a local block grant that has been created. Uh, can you tell us uh, how you're reacting? One of them said, uh, said, didn't you see the road that you took is not flooded? 
we fix that road with the block grant. The other one said, I didn't get the block grant because I didn't pass the audit, but I'm going to get it next time because he got it, I'm going to get it next time. You know, that competition, right, in the flow of money becomes very important. And then I remember asking some of, uh, some of the people that had come to see my father, I said, are you not worried about the corruption uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the representatives? Very interesting, this uh, uh, man said to me, he said, look, when you contract things at central government, we don't know what is happening. You allow contracting here, we know exactly what Manik Bhai is doing. So you give him the money and we'll take care of him. See, what is interesting is people say, if you decentralize, you decentralize corruption. What this person was saying, I will know much better because I know the money is there. But if you're spending the money all the way up to, I, I have no idea. Who do I hold accountable? Very interesting uh, dynamics in that, to your point, the political process of change, right? So decentralization itself creates a, a political, uh, political process. Um, on the, on the taxation, uh, we want to separate out the problem. Uh, today, formal taxpayers in Bangladesh are very low number. This number has to grow. There's no, no doubt about it, right? Uh, how much tax does Boshundara pay, right? You saw today the names of uh, people who have been uh, pointed out uh, as bank defaulters. Uh, uh, you know, tomorrow I'll go to a wedding and those very people will be received with uh, open arms. Uh, so, you know, society also should take the blame uh, for their behavior. Uh, why is it that you go to a wedding and you know this person is a defaulter and yet you treat him like a king, right? So we also bear responsibility as, uh, as citizens in our behavior. Let's not blame government uh, uh, all the time. But this tax base has to grow. And as the tax base grows, the second problem, how you allocate a certain portion to subnational, automatically comes in. Uh, but uh, very important that whatever is our tax base, a small portion should be given unconditionally to local governments. Otherwise, you won't create that, uh, that accountability. Uh, it, it, the information that disparity between Union Porishod and uh, Upazila, uh, you looked at it as a project management issue. That's really interesting. Economists wouldn't look at it as a project management issue. They would look at it as an incentive issue. But what you're saying is, I want to projectize it. In projectizing it, I want to bring out the, dis the, the lack of information, and I want to bring out the disequilibrium. I'm with you. And digital uh, uh, power of bringing out uh, the information is very powerful. You're spot on. Um, I do have to say that one of the things we've learned about digitization is it does not lead to spatial decentralization. Uh, it, the power of cities or, or urban centers to bring people remains as strong with digitization or as opposed to without. So this is where we need to understand what drives cities, what drives municipalities. It's a very powerful, uh, uh, powerful story. What we've also learned is that automa automation is not leading to loss of employment uh, because there is a lot of productivity gains which draws in more employment, but it requires a different skill base for our workers. So uh, we are seeing countries like Bangladesh, India, beginning to shift the skill training to meet the automation because they know there's going to be demand for, uh, for uh, workers. One thing I'll tell the students, one of the things we are learning today is that your generation will change jobs at least six times in your lifetime, right? I probably come from the last gen generation that could say one job, maybe two jobs, but your generation five to six times you will change jobs, which means you have to, you have to develop the skills of adaptability. You have to learn the skills of shifting knowledge, taking knowledge and shifting knowledge to learn, right? That's a very different uh, skill base than the traditional skill base that have been taught in universities. And the question we have to ask North-South University is, what do you impart as uh, education skills? Do you allow this adaptability for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, the next generation? That's what digitization is, is doing. Uh, but I think 
Bangladesh, and you, you mentioned this, Bangladesh has a lot to gain in the digitization uh, world. Um, uh, you know, and Prime Minister, I think, very cleverly has said, digitization and smart economy are mirror images of each other, and we have to travel that, uh, that distance. That's what uh, most, uh, most countries are beginning to do. the second round uh, we have uh, dr mahbub yes please very briefly mahbub rahman professor of political science i want to say it's fascinating absolutely fascinating anyway i was a part of uh, a research project called local level planning and development it was world bank funded project where economists like abu abdullah akir rahman uh, ainun nishad and Atik Rehman, they were a lawyer associate. What we found that at Upazela level, a kind of power competition exists between three persons, Upazela chairman, member of parliament, and the UNO. And I would say competition, it is actually conflict, where very unfortunately, the unfortunately, <laughs> MP is the most powerful one, and then the, the civil servant, the UNO, and Upozala chairman is the least powerful. They themselves even feel that they are the victims somehow, neglected part of the entire process. Here lies the problem that we have been talking about the changing of the tiers or structures, which Bangladesh has actually experienced. And when actually Upozala was introduced, for whatever reason, could be military authoritarian ruler or legitimacy purpose, but the process was excellent in a sense that a new tier is created and new structure with institutions, with certain decentralized power and activities. However, with this power dilemma, practically the entire aim or objective is lost. If it may sound too much, but I would caution that before even we say it has produced some positive result, it still requires another investigation for coming to that conclusion. My question to you is, uh, with this change of the tier and the structures, isn't it that our political leaders need to be the leaders, our uh, bureaucrats need to be civil servant, and then the representatives actually have to be the really, really people's representative. So what is there? Okay, Dr. Mahmoud. A kind of mindset is required, changing the mind because they have to be the part of the change. Otherwise, no matter what we try to, to change, change may not take place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so Dr. Bari and uh, then uh, Dr. Norman Swajo. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, this is Javed Bari. Um, actually, uh, my father also came from a village of Brahman Baria, and at one point he, he became a DC. Now, historically, we know that DC is actually the tax collector. And uh, that's uh, from the colonial uh, period. That's how it came. And, and the irony is that still now, if there is a, an, an accident, we see that uh, the DC is giving 1,000 taka or 1 lakh taka to the family. Uh, so the, he is the representative of the central government. And we have uh, heard from your discussion all the uh, tensions and the, um, uh, the problems in uh, between or among the bureaucrats, the local um, uh, representatives. One thing um, I thought is missing. Uh, if you remember in the early 80s when the um, Upojala system or upgraded Thana started, um, uh, then uh, there was also the Upojala uh, magistrate and Upojala court. And uh, uh, to me, uh, one of the main reasons that the Upojala system or that decentralization uh, concept didn't uh, succeed was that that we uh, that the government couldn't um, take, bring the judiciary close to the 
people because in Bangladesh judiciary is very very uh, important because we have lots of people a uh, very um, small amount of um, um, I mean land for per per uh, person so so that uh, what's uh, my question is that that uh, is that something vital uh, judiciary bringing judiciary to the local government level and um, and what is the international experience uh, in other countries the other the second question is that uh, you talk uh, on the centralized and decentralized examples of um, spe specifically johannesburg uh, how is that uh, working is it uh, something that is working fine uh, parts uh, because if you are uh, you said like you are uh, here as a, a, a BOT member, but uh, I can't um, uh, stop my temptation <laughs> uh, because you are also, uh, you work in World Bank for a very long time. And we know that in World Bank there, you finance uh, IPF, DPF, and P4R model. Uh, specifically, my uh, 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 this is my curiosity that you started that, uh, uh, that uh, program for uh, results model, P4R model since 2012. Uh, and uh, in Bangladesh, you have implemented in a couple of um, pro um, projects and LGD has won. What's the experience? Because here you are uh, empowering the uh, a particular uh, uh, department to, uh, to disperse the money. You are just giving money and you are just asking for ensuring the results. So okay. three questions, uh, judiciary. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you Dr. Mari. Uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay, so because we are running short of time, we want to finish this uh, by one. Uh, so I request the next uh, question is whether to just do it by one minute, please. Dr. Norm. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Norm Swazo, a professor of philosophy and the current director of the Office of Research here at NSU now into my ninth year as foreign faculty member on campus. Uh, I found your uh, analysis very penetrating. It reminds me of the time when I was an undergraduate, about the same time you were an undergraduate, you at Brown and I at Princeton, when there was this world order discourse in which there was the paradigm circulating, and Vice Chancellor mentioned it just a couple of days ago, about thinking globally and acting locally. And uh, in my capacity here as professor, I'm also editor of a new journal, SIPG, Center for Peace Studies Sponsoring, which is the, the North-South Journal of Peace and Global Studies. So I have a proposal. In volume one, issue number two, we are having invited papers, in which case, if you have your presentation in the form of a narrative presentation paper, I welcome you to submit your paper to the journal. If you would honor us with, with that particular uh, uh, request, and we would be very happy to publish that in volume uh, one, issue two, which uh, we hope to issue in June of uh, 2023. So there, there's plenty of time we would grant you, obviously, but that's my request to you. Thank you very much for your analysis. Very good suggestion, but uh, as a, not as a representative of World Bank, but as a citizen of Bangladesh. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for that proposition. So, Professor Abdul Rab Khan and then Dr. Shomiksha Kwirala. Thank you, sir, for your excellent presentation. Uh, I'll just take up one issue you, uh, you know, highlighted in our discussion on role of NGOs, that are NGOs creating a failed state. It's a thick bolahut se jere Bangladesh so far the development hoyse, uh, particularly empowerment the women, the empowerment the poor, poor landless people. It's a jono NGO discourse se wangin dio kaj gulo really kaj kore se. Ramo deshon the. E wangin wangin the Amit Bhair je and the break shift that was a different. You know, kintu je traditionally je se wangin gulo contamination Asia, amader ekhane wangin standardized hoyga se. Same NGO style of working, more centralized. Because I mean, difference between the local government and NGO mode, because of their service delivery, highly routinized, highly bureaucratized. Because like I said, I'm going to, there is a kind of deterioration in the quality of service deliberation in the part of the NGOs. You can buy their funders, and you can't get so local. Because the NGO discourse, I'm going to revive it. Otherwise, it's just a magic thing. It's just a magic thing that's not working any longer. Break, I mean, I'm not going to survive. So, I'm going to survive. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Shomisha Kurela. She is our 
new faculty in the department from Nepal. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for clarifying uh, many doubts, actually, particularly when Nepal is transitioning towards decentralization, like you right, rightly pointed out. We are going towards uh, like this provincial structure, and there has been a lot of backlash uh, saying that it's going to create a lot of financial burden, just the corruption thing that you rightly pointed, and I'm really convinced with your argument on that. But my question to you is like um, on the role of media, how do you see the role of local media for accountability? Because in Nepal, for instance, our community radio, uh, local FM stations has been doing incredible job when it comes to making local politicians, local bureaucrats uh, uh, more accountable. They, so they sort of want to have a good image. So, you know, that kind of does like check and balances. That's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Dr. Rizwan Khair, our another faculty, former administrator, converted <laughs> academician. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, my question to uh, Dr. Junaid is, uh, I think, is uh, something interesting. I mean, do we want to see decentralization concept uh, outside the context of state society relationships? Okay, if we want to see it after the state society, nothing is going to work. And I think that's very fundamental to the nature. Do we understand the nature of the state in Bangladesh? Have we understood it without understanding the state of nature in the Bangladesh? Whatever intervention we do from the World Bank is not going to work. And that's something, a fundamental question that needs to be asked. And in the, unfortunately, if you look at the academic uh, research in greater Bangladesh, I haven't found uh, very, very, very little you know, uh, research in that relation between state and society. And there's very much, very little writing about the nature of the state itself. You know, there are, there are pieces that have been written, but you know, it's, that's, a, that's a very, very fundamental question that needs to be, at least on the academic side, I think we need to give our inputs on that. But my question to you is, do we see uh, decentralization apart you know, as an intervention from the state without understanding the state society relationship, I, I don't believe any kind of intervention is going to work. What do you think? Okay, thank you. So, the last question uh, from Professor Imdad. Uh, well, in ancient Bengal, we had a long tradition of decentralization, uh, historically, what we come across. Uh, which was popularly known as Panchayat, uh, village Panchayat, and self. Uh, uh, reliant villages, what uh, Kalmars has addressed it as, uh, uh, as community uh, uh, self-reliant system. Uh, so this system existed for a long time in our tradition and with the intrusion of uh, foreign power, I mean the colonial power, this institution uh, gradually uh, uh, disappeared. And after independence, Indian government, as the Congress government, they uh, they revived this institution under the Panchayati administration at, at the block level, at the union level, and village level, as uh, you have referred to correctly. And in Bangladesh, after independence, Bangabundu Sheikh Mojib Rahman is politically referred to this Panchayati Raj. And he was also trying to revive this institution in Bangladesh. But due to political change, you know, uh, the military government under General Zia, Zia Rahman. He introduced a village government system. And once General Ashraf came to power, he introduced the Upajala system. So this kind of experimentation we have been through you know, since independence in Bangladesh. And uh, in decentralization, there are different types of decentralization, devolution type, deconcentration, delegation. So devolution type existed in ancient Bengal, what we experienced. And General Ashraf introduced the deconcentration system. And currently, what we are experiencing in Bangladesh, this is uh, the extension of centralized government power to the local level. Uh, it is not even deconcentration. The, uh, the current practice, it has extended the power and capacity and influence of the central government to the local level through MPs, through bureaucracy. So all these institutions are functioning. And at the... Uh, well, uh, uh, local administration, what we see, uh, uh, Dr. Mahabub has referred to about Upajala system. And in the district levels, uh, what we see nowadays, the district uh, council has been, uh, you know, in, in place. 
And the same situation is prevailing at the district level. The DC tries to you know, make some kind of balance between the uh, uh, district representative and also between the MP. So this kind of uh, uh, dichotomy is going on at the local level. And to, ma to make the decentralization effort and practice a success, I, I, what I understand that these local level institutions must be self-reliant, they must be autonomous, and for making those institutions autonomous, uh, they need to have some economic capacity developed instead of depending on the central government finance. So th that is the uh, real problem existing. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And that I just will come back to the uh, speaker uh, with the privilege to ask the last question. So in my view that, uh, as you said, that why where we are seeing Bangladesh in the next 10, 15, 20 years. So one of my own understanding is that Bangladesh will gradually become a city state in 25 to 30 years. Maybe a very big city state with 200 million people or something like that. Because if we just, just travel from Dhaka to Mamanshing by road, you'll not find villages anymore. If you, you, have to, you have to take a special route to find out a real village nowadays if you really want to uh, show your children that this is the village life. And these are coming. The urbanization is very rapidly coming because of our homogeneity and the geographical advantage. Probably the whole uh, the country will next 20, 25 years will be a city. Only there will be pockets of agricultural uh, productions in some places. So, so that would be probably another thing that we need to uh, consider that if really we become a city state. And as you rightly said, that urbanization is always a good thing for economic growth and development. So, how would we? face that challenge or that opportunities that becoming a, if really it happens that a city is straight in 25, 30 years time. Thank you, sir. Uh, a lot of deep questions here. Uh, very hard to do justice to it in a Q and A. Uh, so let me, let me say some common themes uh, and see if I can answer from that point of view. Um, I think it's very important for all of us to recognize that the path Bangladesh will take in its state structure will be Bangladesh's own path. Uh, what I'm trying to do is share with you some of the lessons that we've learned globally and say these are the lessons we have learned globally. Now, the challenge is for you as a university to begin to say, where does Bangladesh fit in this global story? Where is it different in this global story? And what will be our path of state structure in the, in the future? So very important that uh, uh, you, you walk away from my presentation as one of really asking you that question, not one of where I'm offering you a blueprint from South Africa or, or any other country. Right? That's extremely, uh, extremely important. Uh, mindset. I think the mindset of Bangladesh has changed significantly over the, over the years. If it hadn't, we wouldn't be now the highest per capita income uh, in South Asia. And one of the fastest uh, uh, development uh, uh, stories of a low-income country in the world. Uh, mindset is a function of what happens around you. So I don't think I am too concerned about our mindset. It will change. What I'm concerned about is what are the structures and incentives that affect our mindset, right? And how do you change that? Uh, and I think that this is, uh, this is uh, going to be the big challenge. The description of the Upozela MP union conflict is precisely the challenge, right? And in that challenge, how does local government and local citizenry express their views has to be our design, right? Uh, I think where money goes, where responsibilities flow, uh, where the roles of different parts of uh, the bureaucracy, judiciary, and so on are, are done 
will affect that uh, that uh, uh, nexus, right? Uh, but we need to do more more work. We need to bring out the nexus, and we need to then talk about talk about it. Um, but I think that the the lessons I've shared from the rest of the world offer us levers of uh, of analysis for that. Judiciary, I didn't touch judiciary on this one. Judiciary is extremely important. And in judiciary, I think the, the two forces globally we talk about is separation of judiciary as one of the, four, one of the pillars of, uh, of state, and then the devolution of judiciary. Uh, and in Bangladesh, both factors will, will work out. But uh, absolutely, uh, it's not one that I, I presented, but there's a whole literature that's looking at the evolution of judiciary in the context of, uh, of uh, decentralization. Uh, and I think uh, we ought to invite someone uh, from the judicial uh, uh, you know, law departments and others to reflect on the relation between judiciary and decentralization. Uh, I think this will be very, uh, very important. Johannesburg, fascinating. Uh, the restructuring of Johannesburg allowed it to go from uh, uh, non-investment grade to investment grade city where it was able to raise money. Right? Then over time, what happened was, you know those companies that I've shown? Separation of power, clawback began, right? The mayor started bringing back, why? You couldn't do any more employment, right? If you're gonna hold me accountable for delivery of water, don't hold me accountable for the inputs. Right? Suddenly the mayor lost the ability to put people in jobs, right? So that tension has started to, to come in. But probably the most uh, powerful story of, uh, of uh, South Africa is the dominant monopoly political party, ANC. And uh, uh, what they do is representative, uh, uh, what is the voting system, where you vote for the party and the party selects the mayors. It's not a direct vote of the mayor, proportional voting. That created an accountability dysfunction in a decentralized, right? Which meant that expenditure, revenue, structured devolution had gone ahead of political devolution. That disequilibrium is causing problems, uh, problems here. Now, what that uh, tells us that we live in a dynamic world and state structures need to adapt and change because we're always in disequilibrium, right? Uh, and today, South Africa faces the disequilibrium of a monopoly party, right? People are comparing the African National Congress to the Indian National Congress. Indian National Congress is 40, 50 years of monopoly. What did it lead to? And what will ANC's monopoly lead to? Right? That's a political question, but it has a direct implication on the running of the state structure. That's a huge implications for us. It goes to your point, the nature of the state has to be understood, right? But don't analyze the nature of the state outside the lessons we're learning from the rest of the world, because we're not that different from the rest of the world, even though we are different from the rest of the world. Right, that's the that's the contradiction we have to have to uh, uh, have to manage. P four R the LGSP. I think the the lessons are very positive. They're very positive. But remember also that when you're so below the production frontier, the first boost takes you to the production frontier. Staying at the production frontier is another story. So what has happened to LGSP since then? Right is a is an interesting thing. I'll I'll tell you a very interesting story. I was in India, and the minister for local government in India uh, told me that your prime minister and your finance minister is coming to see Dr. Manmohan Singh. Uh, what must I say? That was uh, of, uh, at that time. Uh, uh, prime minister was uh, Khalid Azia, and the finance minister, Mr. Saifur Rahman. Mr. Saifur Rahman was against LGSP. Uh, he did not uh, want to send money to local government. Uh, he had his own way of saying rubbish like uh, uh, Bhai, but it was a little more harsher, shall we say. So when they came to India, uh, and I told the local government minister, 
of India to tell the congratulate the finance uh, to congratulate the Prime Minister of Bangladesh for having a block grant system to Union Porishad that was better than any block grant system in India. So he said that. And then about three weeks later, a colleague of mine called up and said, you won't believe this. Saifur Rahman just increased the uh, LGSP by 20%, right? That's, that's very interesting. But that, by the way, is an example of competition between, between uh, states and therefore competition between local government is a good thing when you give powers, right? But LGSP has worked. I, I think today I would look at LGSP and see if the original design has stayed. Has there been clawback? Has it evolved? I think that becomes uh, very, very important. Um, regarding the paper, uh, you know, I, uh, one of the things I've learned uh, in becoming uh, vice president is you can't do the things you really enjoy, which is writing and reading and publishing and, and, and sharing experiences. I'll do my best. But quid pro quo is you have to have a, 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 a special edition on the state of local government in Bangladesh. Get other writers from legal, from political science and others to comment on the state of local government in Bangladesh. I think that will be a very powerful story into which we should ask the question, the state of NGOs and local government. Because I think you've asked a very important question, where are NGOs today? And I think you're also right in separating out Abid Bhai, because his vision of Bangladesh and his vision of where BRAC and NGOs ought to be in Bangladesh is, is unique. But don't forget the history of South Asia, Akhtar Hamid Khan, right? He begins the story of, uh, local, gov of uh, local communities. So the history of local leaders is quite rich in South Asia. And I think we ought to do a, 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 a lesson which looks at from Akhtar Hamid Khan to Abid Bhai, what has been the transition uh, of local communities in, uh, uh, and, and NGOs? It, 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 it'll be a proud moment for South Asia, but it'll also be a, a reflect, uh, reflection. Uh, on, uh, on Nepal, uh, you know, uh, I had the, when the Maoist government uh, came to power uh, or were coming to power, uh, uh, I, uh, I facilitated the first conversation between the World Bank and Prachanda, right? And that was a very fascinating conversation. The, the only way, you know, my vice president at that time called me and he said, look, the Maoists is, are coming to government from being a liberation movement to now wanting to come to government. I want to talk to Prachanda. So can you arrange that? And my reaction to my vice president was, what do I do? Look up 1-800-PRACHANDA and give a phone call? I mean, what, what, what do you expect? So at that time, I called up uh, uh, Mr. Mac Maharaj, who is from South Africa, who led the ANC's underground movement, very well known uh, in the uh, leftist liberation movements. So I, and I had worked with him. So I asked him and I said, I need a favor from you. We're trying to get hold of Prachanda. And I think you would be able to help me. And his reaction was, he says, let me understand this right. You are world banker. You're asking an underground leader of the ANC to contact Prachanda so you can have a conversation with him. Exactly what are you trying to tell me? So I said, that's about what I'm trying to tell you. Uh, so he did arrange the uh, meeting with Prachanda. Uh, and I asked Mac Maharaj to join. And what was interesting was the both of them knew each other uh, from the networks, right? These were leftist leaders. And they'd heard about each other. So when they met, they, they talked. And it's a very interesting story. Prachanda is telling Mac Maharaj that peace uh, accord. And I'm trying to get, uh, uh, get my commanders uh, to, to come into the government. And they're not, they're not listening to me. And they think I'm selling away our liberation movement. Mac then tells Prachanda, oh, but uh, we in the ANC said the same to, uh, to Mandela when he was negotiating with the whites. And Prachanda said, you told, uh, you told Mandela that he was selling away the country? He said, yes, we told him that. He says, what did Mandela do? He says, Mandela created a line of communication between the negotiation and the commanders. 
every day they would uh, they would get information on what was happening and two members of the commanders were part of the negotiating uh, team right and so then prachanda says to mac you must go meet my commanders and tell them that story right and he did and he had that that exchange right now if you think the world bank does a few things this is a story i'm telling you no one knows right this is what the world bank allowed me to do was to enable one liberation movement talk to another liberation movement about what it means to come into governance right fighting for a nation is one thing governing a nation is something else right it was a quite a quite an extraordinary uh, story your role about media absolutely community radio absolutely essential role to create accountability in the in the system um, the state and society i can't disagree ancient bengal and the evolution devolution and so on i agree i didn't use those words because those words are so much in our literature we all have a definition of it whereas what i was trying to talk about is a political fiscal economic uh, sharing of power between different tiers uh, of uh, of government um, fascinating uh, story of city state uh, that requires a bit of thought right because you're talking about a nation state that becomes a city state as opposed to an island like singapore becoming a city state right those are two different uh, storylines but your point that urbanization is here to stay with us and we have to manage urbanization how do we manage urbanization i think one of the most vital strengths of bangladesh are the mayors of our poroshavas you start looking at the mayors of our poroshavas they're fascinating right the key question is can we give them a independent strength relative to their political parties if you can create that separation i mean they will be part of political parties that's the nature of of politics but the poroshava mayors need to be strengthened need to be supported because that's where the future of bangladesh will be in our small towns in the aggregation of our small towns major major story but at the end of the day uh you know we can all be proud as bangladesh here where we have arrived there is no doubt about it uh the word fragility and conflict is used in the world bank today bangladesh had to go through fragility and conflict uh to become a nation at a time when fragility and conflict were not part of the development story you know our freedom fight the 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 complete massacre assassination of the father of our nation and his family and then what happened afterwards for democracy to come back if anyone tells me that that was a linear path right we would do ourselves a disservice what this nation has done to lift itself to become where it is today we don't need lectures from anyone in the world but it is the onus on us to now think the 15 years from now where will we be and it's in the onus of universities like north south university to actually create the the uh, learning basis of that uh, of that question and i really look at uh, sipg to be a center of excellence that will help ask these questions where is the bangladesh state going 10 years from now the future is ours but we have to grab it thank you very much thank you very much uh, uh, for this concluding uh, kind of observation and remarks i think uh, we got also this idea and i already uh, taken the note that probably sapg will will start this study that uh, what should be the stress stress structure of bangladesh in terms of decentralization uh, because we have expertise uh, and this will be a fascinating study uh, before i go to the chair of the session our honorable vice chancellor professor atikul islam i just uh, announce a few uh, uh, notices and the invitation and then i will will uh, go to him uh, the center for peace studies of uh, south asian institute of policy and governance is going to organize a, again a seminar and webinar on the 31st of january that means next tuesday uh, the title is restoring peace in myanmar two years after the military coup so 1st of february is the date of uh, this anniversary of military coup in myanmar 
And we have invited for a very interestingly that for the first time probably in Bangladesh, a representative of NUG, National Unity Government, which is a parallel government in Myanmar now. Uh, he will be joining virtually and also one academic scholars uh, from within Myanmar and some other experts uh, will be there. So I invite you all, you will get the invitation. The second invitation is on 11th of February. Uh, we are going to organize also a discussion meeting with uh, also on, in a way with uh, foreign ministry participation that the Indo-Pacific strategy. You all know that Bangladesh is uh, developing an Indo-Pacific strategy by its own. So we'll have a dialogue with uh, uh, ministry people and also the experts. So we'll send the invitation um, right time. So with that to invitation, I would now like to request our vice chancellor, the chair of the session to give the concluding remarks, sir. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon. Um, it has become a habit to talk on issues about which I know very little. Uh, as a vice chancellor, you got to go and stand up in you know, um, chair sessions, uh, try to learn something, and to try to regurgitate uh, part of it in a clever way. Uh, basically, uh, I'll, the first thing I want to do is to thank our honorable board member, Dr. Janayat Kamal um, Ahmed, for giving us time. I know that he is on leave, but he is not really on leave because the World Bank um, chief is in the city and he relies on the person with all the local experience. And that's why he has been very busy. Um, Within his leave, even he was um, called to go to South Africa for something that must be very urgent. So we didn't get the amount of time that we thought we would get from him. Anyway, uh, kept his word and made this presentation. What an eloquent, relevant, and insightful presentation. Its beauty is not in the solutions that it gives, Communities and the questions that it raises uh, that will need further research, and we task SAPG with that. Uh, uh, my idea is that look, uh, decentralization was uh, is a relatively new thing in the Indian subcontinent, uh, particularly in Bangladesh. Uh, during the British time. There's not much of a role for the public representative, for the people's representatives. You didn't have MPs. Um, what you had is the DM, the deputy magistrate, and the DM and the DC, SDOs, they would run it like they are fiefdom. No one is able to challenge them or their wisdom in any way. Pakistan did not bother much about election. You know, they had their military. Um, for most of the time to run the country. So the MPs did not pose a problem uh, for the local governments. Bangladesh started with uh, uh, Bangabandhu tried to decentralize government. He had the Uttara Gona uh, We divided the dis uh, country into about 60 or so districts and he uh, placed district governors. The interesting thing is those governors were not elected by the people, but they were bureaucrats that were given the charge of individual districts. Then we had the uh, sword coming into play. Uh, and what we have seen uh, during uh, the first rule by military government is a rerun of the Pakistani policies whether in economics uh, or in society. Uh, of course, Pakistan had that, Ayub Khan had that basic democratic, uh, what the basic Democrats, uh, they never got much of a power. Uh, what happened? President Eshab decided that he will go for uh, the UN knows what is called the, um, I was not in the country then, so 
and the thanas became a center upgraded thanas so you had the uh, chair of that you know was he elected probably by the people okay then otherwise he couldn't be chair uh, then you had the um, uno unit uh, the the nirbahi officer upazila nirbahi officer so you had the chair of the um, upazila who was elected by the people then you had the uh, government appointed uno then you had the you have the mp the three of them the division of power and authority between them was never made clear cut uh, as far as uh, financing is concerned who has control of the funds who can, can they raise any funds if so who can raise funds then the the money that comes from the top who controls it uh, there is even now um occasional uh spat between a dc and an mp who should sit where uh who is superior and i think we had in the parliament also uh, some discussion uh, about a year ago uh, whether the dc takes precedence or the mp takes precedence so to be uh, to delegate power to the lower level um i think uh, whoever is in power should make it very clear what are the roles of these three positions as far as delegation is concerned no use delegating power to someone who doesn't have control of the purse now the mayoral position in the western countries is a very very important position the mayor can raise funds councils you know local government state government federal government if you go that way each of these governments have uh, some power to raise funds to raise finance now the mayors of our cities i don't know to what extent they are allowed to raise funds and what is uh, the proportion of funds raised by this sort of things versus uh, funds coming from above and how do they get fused together and how decisions are made so it looks like in that area we got to need uh, a lot of to do a lot of thinking and that's where north south university would like to make a contribution we want to do the research not only through the sipg but everyone else can do research um, in collaboration with the sipg or outside uh, north south university is a university that emphasizes applied research we want to do research that has an end user impact we want to do research to inform the policies by the government by industry and by the professions uh, and therefore this is a very uh, timely and relevant and extremely interesting and eloquent presentation we got from our honorable board member um, we don't we didn't get it from the uh, vice chair of the uh, vice president of the world bank so it's not in his official capacity uh, it's in his capacity as a board member of nsu and as a bangladeshi citizen um, i'm sure he's a citizen he's a dual citizen you know right well, only bangladeshi just imagine well there is uh, we can see uh, patriotism and uh, loyalty anyway uh, thank you so very much and thanks for all of you uh, for taking the time to come and listen to this extremely valuable speech and i believe that we will do the relevant research in the area and inform the policy makers thank you thank you honorable vice chancellor so we are at the end of the event uh, so the formalities are done so students you are invited to come here and if you want to take a picture with our speaker and also vice chancellor and the guests and the others uh, you can